Uh, and also thank you all for being here this early in the morning for our morning family session today. So the session today will be about transforming healthcare through our graduates. We have four esteemed speakers here with us today. And this will be run a little bit differently from the usual family sessions. With a large crowd you know, set up here in the learning studio, with lots of opportunities as well as equipment for uh, interaction, we wanted to make the session as interactive as possible. So each of our four speakers will be introduced, and then they'll speak for about six to seven minutes on several different topics. And then at the end of it all, we want to have a lively and engaging discussion with all of you, um, asking each other questions and learning from one another as we think about how to transform healthcare through our graduates. So I hope that's okay for everybody, and uh, later I'll just set up the rules for the um, discussion when we get to the floor session later. So we'll start with our first speaker today, um, and uh, uh, Professor Adiva Kamaran Zaman um, is um, the current dean of Faculty of Medicine at the University of Malaya, and also an adjunct associate professor at Yale University. Um, she graduated from Monash University and trained in internal medicine and infectious diseases at the Monash Medical Center and Fairfield Infectious Diseases Hospital in Melbourne, Australia. Um, she's also presently leading a national effort to establish a national postgraduate medical training curriculum for all the medical specialties in Malaysia. So the first topic of today, uh, which uh, Professor Vita will uh, speak to us about, will be about curricular change in order to equip our graduates for the 21st century. So, over you, Professor Vita. Good morning, and thank you very much for inviting me to this um, wonderful conference. Um, so, I might have been asked to address um, the need for a curricular change to uh, accommodate or to equip our graduates uh, in this uh, you know, fast developing uh, changes in healthcare that's uh, spurred by technology. I think the, the, the good thing is uh, we've got these millennials, or what you want to call them, the digital natives who are very um, comfortable with, with technology, unlike me. Um, but I guess uh, at the same token, we, we cannot um, fall back to what we've always been doing in medicine in the past, which is see one, do one, teach one, and expect that um, whilst these digital natives um, are familiar with, with the tools more than we are, that um, they don't need uh, some kind of uh, structured curriculum to see them through um, the, the fast-paced changes. Um, but the, the problem is, and, and I'm sure all of you who have introduced uh, uh, some form of uh, curricular changes uh, to accommodate uh, technology, will probably hear people in anatomy, people in medicine, people in surgery saying, well, you know, the, the curriculum is already packed. Um, how do we uh, fit more in? How do we fit um, clinical informatics? How do we fit in, you know, data analysis? So I think that's a challenge uh, uh, we face. Um, so I'll be interested. But first of all, how many medical schools in the room have actually got formal curriculum and technology? Um, do you? At, at, uh, your school at the middle? The medical school itself? Yeah. A formal technology curriculum? Yeah, in, in, within, the, within the undergraduate curriculum. In the medical program? Mm, uh, medical program. Well, yes, it's incorporated like, mm. you know, in the public health uh, program, like data and things like that, but there's no formal. Right, right. And here, um, okay, see? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Looking at my colleague Martin for help, but I don't think we have that, do we? We don't. Do we exceed? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so, well, and in, in AUM, we also haven't uh, introduced formal curriculum. And as I was preparing for this talk, um, and I looked at what the Americans are doing, I think um, only about uh, less than 50% of uh, American schools have introduced um, kind of formal cur curricula in, let's say, uh, in telemedicine. I think uh, the, the last survey was uh, around 50%. So, um, and uh, the American Association of Medicine is, is um, pushing for, for a more formal uh, introduction of, uh, you know, this, this technological uh, um, 
yeah, curriculum, uh, lessons, training um, within the curriculum. So what are the areas, uh, if, we, if we're all going to make these changes, that um, will need to be introduced? I think, um, firstly, um, uh, well, as I said, this is not from, from experience or from my own research, but from, from reviewing the literature. And, uh, the first of it is telemedicine, and um, the, what the Americans have done, or the schools in, in the US uh, that have uh, introduced this, uh, some do it um, as an elective, some have uh, truly incorporated it into their curriculum, and um, it is around, you know, just, just like uh, we do um, skills training by the bedside, it would appear that um, they are introducing um, telemedicine training mostly around communication skills, um, but utilizing telemedicine um, as an interface rather than, than the patient interface. Um, so I think that's one area um, that, that we need to think about. And certainly um, in, in Malaysia where you know, telemedicine has been informally used in a, in a big way to reach out to doctors and patients in rural areas, we, we certainly um, need to think about uh, more formal instructions uh, in how to use telemedicine. The second area is, of course, and health and the use of apps uh, for um, all sorts of things, for so disease management, uh, etc. I think one uh, important area that we need to get our graduates to understand is, you know, in terms of evaluating um, utility of apps. Uh, there's so many out there. Um, what works, what doesn't work, uh, uh, and so forth. And, and uh, the third area is, of course, data analytics. And that's probably big data analytics. And that's probably one area that we're much more comfortable with, I guess, uh, incorporating into the curricula. Um, and uh, that possibly is a little bit more easily done than, than the other aspects of uh, technology. Um, so, in addition, I think Simone's going to take up on this uh, uh, at the end, but uh, as we've been discussing in the last uh, day or so, um, and certainly in, in the plenaries, uh, the opening plenaries from Dave and um, Professor uh, Suresh, I think um, not forgetting the, the human aspects, uh, I think uh, we will find that as we use more and more technology, patients will expect more and more um, uh, of that, that doctor-patient relationship which, and communication uh, skills that um, we will need to emphasize and, and perhaps uh, make even stronger uh, in the curriculum. You know, I like to tell my patients in Malaysia, um, a lot of patients still go to faith healers, um, or as we call them, bomos, you know, even well-educated people, doctors, lawyers, politicians, they all go to faith healers. And I, I say to the medical students, why do you think this is so, you know, and we have so many doctors and, and, and uh, hospitals now, and, and I suspect it's because faith healers give patients time, listen to them, hold their hands, um, and uh, you know they may be giving them fake news, but uh, or fake diagnoses. But you know it's what the patients want to hear, what the patients um, feel comfortable with. So I think that faith healer in the 21st century is going to be uh, replaced by um, the computer screen. But that need to to be there for the patient, to listen to them, to empathise, um, probably is going to remain. Um, equally important, if not more important. So, I'll leave it there for now. Thanks very much, Adina. So, that was a strong start, and I think uh, um, some of the things that uh, Adina brought up, the importance of uh, telemedicine, uh, um, the skilling up our graduates to handle data science, for example, are important, but it also brought up an equally important point that technology also has a potential to connect us, but also to divide us as well with new and different things. <coughs> So um, I think this will definitely be a challenge we're going to face. And it's not something that we just have to prepare our students and graduates for, it's something that we have to prepare our faculty for as well. 
So our next speaker will be Ujiba. So Ujiba is the director for the Center of Medical Education at the Young Women's School of Medicine and also a senior consultant in health professions education at the Ministry of Health uh, Singapore. So Ujiba has been involved in curriculum development, quality assurance, as well as accreditation and in many arenas, undergrad medical education, postgrad medical education, as well as in health profession education in general. And uh, Ujiba is an old friend and we work together a couple of days um, at the university level and at uh, the ministry level. So to tell us about a little bit about faculty development and how to train our faculty to help our graduates prepare for the 21st century, I will hand over the mic to Ujiba. Thank you, Nigel. Okay. Uh, and also, uh, I'm really honored to be here and uh, to be part of this uh, conference, the very first conference, so I want to thank all of you. Uh, you will also realize that none of us are using PowerPoint because we firmly believe that power corrupts and PowerPoint corrupts absolutely. Uh, so, so we want to, uh, rather than to lull you uh, with PowerPoint and beautiful uh, slides, we want you to think, reflect and engage later on. So my focus is that I'm going to start off with a statement. Uh, I'm going to share the biggest challenge or obstacle for developing uh, effective, empathetic, efficient clinical practitioner from a medical student, that transformation, the biggest obstacle or challenge is our faculty. We can't get our faculty to make that medical student into an effective practitioner in the future. Now, why am I saying this? Is it because that our faculty are bad people? All of us are bad people. Because they deliberately want to scuttle the efforts of the school or the, 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 the nation's vision of making efficient, effective, empathetic, caring practitioners. But to understand this, I think we need to take a step back. We need to understand our faculty. Now, who are our faculty? Well, we have biomedical science educators. We have clinician educators, a large number of clinician educators. And then we also have medical educators, like me or Freeman sitting over there. Um, and also we have uh, the administrators. But I'll, I'll leave the large pool of administrators today because uh, leadership and administration will deal with each other. But why are they a challenge rather than being helpful and enhancing this transformation. Well, first of all, we need to understand that if they do not know what they need to know, then it's difficult for them to engage with them. So the first thing is that there's so much in medical education, what works, the best practices, but I'm very surprised that when I engage my colleagues in the clinical setting, most of them, they are unwell. They, 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 they do not know what are some of the best practices and why we are using them. They know how to do a mini CEX, how to do engage a drops, but they do not know the pedagogical background or the framework in which these workplace-based assessments are based on. And then, because of that, they sometimes do a lot of changes, which then later on, they themselves and the students or the residents share that it's a useless thing. This, this team-based learning is not working. So come to my lecture afterwards. Right? I'm giving a secret lecture after the TPL session in Tantop Syndrome 3. Right? So come to that. So if you do not understand the pedagogical framework, the construct, the concepts well, then it's very difficult to engage. The second reason I feel is that some of us feel that we are, we are going to lose our domain space or our influence in the curriculum. And this is largely because the way that we are being evaluated and assessed. For example, if you lose curricular time, I mean, that's, that's one of the issues that we faced at Yamlune, that some specialties feel that, oh, they can't get additional headcounts. 
because no longer now they can clock in and they are not within that time, therefore they can't get new faculty or they will lose headcounts, they will lose money. Right? So you still want to give that same lecture that you have given for the past 30 years and it's there. And still we want to do cell signaling for 10 hours of the first year curriculum, we don't want to lose that. right? So losing your dominance or your space has an impact in the system in which we practice. The third is the finally the way we are evaluated individually, the number of teaching hours, the student feedback score, the peer feedback score. So you have to get engaged and then you need to have that your space. And more collaboration, more facilitation, faculty development, curricular work are not at the moment counted or significantly counted. So therefore, these all have an impact in this transformation process. And this is why I always like the, the comment when uh, Ron Harden came to Asia Pacific Medical Education Conference in 2008. Our focus was on faculty development because that's the time we bought the international conference in faculty development also, that we ran it combined. So he said, he made a statement, there's no such thing as curriculum development. It's only staff development. So this actually prompted us to do some work on our own. So there's a lot more research in faculty development by others, uh, David Irby, Yvonne Steinert, etc. But I'm going to focus on the few studies that we did and we recently published. And one of the things is that what we looked at was that how did we transform our teachers, our faculty development programs? <coughs> on a side note, this was important to keep our funding going also. The dean was asking, I'm putting in a lot of money, but you know, what are the, where are the returns? So we had to show returns. So we had to do a systematic study. So what we found was that our study which we looked at how did it change the behaviors of our teachers. And it was a mixed method, epistemological study. And uh, let me just quickly share with you. We found three areas, which we can go back to later on during the discussion. Three emerging areas. The first was from ignorance to awareness. Right? Three main themes. Because what we found when we, when we had focus groups with our clinician educators and our students, we interviewed the clinician educators, biomedical science educators, allied health educators, and also our students, their, their own students for two years, follow them. So one of the comments, I was given teaching time slot earlier. I just satisfied that requirement. I didn't really appreciate or understand the bigger picture. Or when students come for my tuition, what you are doing is just what you are teaching your own specialist without much understanding of the rest, how it fits to the rest. So in the past, I didn't pay much attention to which year of students they are coming from. The only thing is that I just taught what I need, regardless of the years. But after attending several workshops and also working with them. We have this now 70-20-10 rule. 70% 70 of the time we work with them and in their own practice areas. 20% of the time, okay, time's up. 20% of the time that we, we, we actually work with, uh, uh, they come to our uh, workshops 10% of the time, 20% of the time uh, that uh, we go to these formal things. So the second emerging theme is from intuition to confirmation and expansion. And we were very happy because some of them were doing things from their own understanding. But after attending several sessions or working with us individually, they managed to expand it. Because we firmly believe that there's no one particular teaching style or pedagogical method. We are giving them a variety of ways, all aligned to what we want to achieve. And they, they engage in these activities, whether it's a didactic lecture to become more interactive. And then one of the, 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 the good things is that, again, I'm quoting, I'm always aware, sorry, since last year, after the workshop I attended, I believe that I am the, I'm in the right direction. I'm always aware of the entrustable professional activities, but right now, I'm always mindful to make sure that I'm teaching is in accordance with the EPAs. Now the third emerging thing uh, that we saw was from individualism to communities of practice. With the right faculty development program at their 
department level or at uh, uh, formal level. We encourage them to form communities of practice. Our integration lead educator community is a good example. They are getting together, basic scientists, clinicians together, to form these communities of practice, not only to improve their teaching, but to investigate whether what they're doing is in the right direction. So I think a lot depends on faculty development program. How we engage the faculty, how we create a system, how we support them through resources and the support, and then of course, recognize the educators for their efforts by various means. Not only focusing on their own, own research, but their support for education. So in conclusion, I think having an effective evidence-based faculty development program makes good business sense because it will have a higher returns of investment. Thank you. brought up about the importance of faculty development, but also recognizing that faculty development and developing our faculty um, interfaces with two systems, the university and school systems in which we function, but also for our students who go to the clinical years, our clinicians or our healthcare system, who have also a different set of incentives. And sometimes as a school, it's not always easy for us to um, adjust or influence the larger systems in the healthcare clusters for which we partner. But it is nonetheless an important consideration for us. So for our next topic, um, we'll be speaking about technology, continuing on the theme which uh, Eva brought up about technology and how to change um, the way we train our young um, medical undergraduates. So our next speaker will be Associate Professor Yosef Khan. So Yosef is the founding director for, of the Center for Occupation Health Sciences and Chair of Health Services and Outcomes Research here at LKC Medicine. So he has worked, uh, he works or has worked with the World Health Organization, the OECD, the World Bank, Global Fund, and is also a board member of BMC Medicine and the Journal of Global Health, and is an editor of the Cochrane Collaboration among many, one of his many, many, many hats. So uh, Yosef's uh, key interests are in the area of digital health, mobile health, digital health education, and occupational health. So speaking about uh, technology, um, I'll hand over to Yosef. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Thank, thank you. Uh, you sometimes need to say three times thank you. <laughs> and, uh, and thank you for coming so early in the morning. Uh, these kind of panel discussions I'm more used to do in the evening and maybe over a glass of wine and, and so on. Uh, so it's quite an experience now to engage you and to have this as a conversation where you will feel that uh, uh, I might fall asleep at that early hour if I wasn't in the panel. Uh, but, uh, and, and uh, yes, just a one more thank you to my co-panelists who said really uh, already many things that I would probably share otherwise. Let me take you for a moment, uh, I'll take half a minute, take you on a dream journey. And that dream journey is I want you to think about the health problem or problems that you personally have or have had. And if anyone hasn't ever had, please do raise a hand. Uh, that would be probably close to a miracle, uh, uh, if not. Um, have you, you imagined your health problem? Uh, so if you think about that, and now think about healthcare that you receive or that you are receiving. Is that how close is that to the ideal that you would like to receive? And secondly, how technologically advanced is it? Is it really embracing the technologies that you use in other domains of your life? So I'm sure that all of you are using smartphones, all of you are uh, doing digital banking. Uh, I want to ask about online shopping, uh, and, and, and I could go on. The point that I'm trying to make here is, I want you to think, you are those who are shaping the future of medical education. You are those who are inspiring the future leaders. And are we applying this 
in how we experience this in our own lives. Now, if we were a smaller group, I would go around with the microphone and uh, and give you a chance to speak, but that might not be for such a large group uh, the right approach. Uh, so I'll share my personal experience. Uh, and I have never communicated via email with my doctor. And I tried a few times to speak on the phone, and sometimes it was successful, sometimes it wasn't. Uh, I tried to access my electronic health records, both in the UK, and here I didn't even try. Uh, because my primary care provider doesn't use electronic health records. And I've been to a few other countries, and my experience was more or less the same. I'll flip around. I'm also a doctor myself, a GP. Uh, I did consult regularly with patients on the phone. I did use electronic health records. But in terms of more sophisticated tools, let's say decision support, uh, let's say quite simple tools to do electronic data capture, no, we are not yet there. Why is that? And uh, I won't get philosophical, don't worry. Uh, but uh, I will highlight to you uh, what I see as low-hanging fruit and or quick wins uh, in four areas. And I think most of them um, have been mentioned already. But I want to go a little bit uh, with some examples uh, to concrete areas. So let's take first uh, patients need to understand uh, or patients need for, if you want, for information, for education. You may know that the second most common reason for searching the internet is for health reason. That's the most second search, uh, the most second most common search uh, of the internet is for health. And uh, even when you do that as a doctor, it's quite challenging to distinguish which information is valuable and which is not. That's a low hanging fruit where we could help. Uh, and to make it more specific, uh, in my clinic, in other clinics, we still give out patient information leaflets as paper. Why are we not doing it digitally? This doesn't need a big investment. It doesn't need a big multi-billion transformation. But it does need a system. It does need a discipline. <coughs> uh, second area, data collection. Or information collection. <laughs> I'll go more specific again to diabetes. Those of you who are doctors, how many hand out written or guidance and then sheets for patients to collect their blood glucose on a paper? Well, if you're doing that, I have good news for you. You're doing the right thing. Why? Because we've assessed diabetes apps and they are not up to scratch. There are over 600, just in English, yes, you've heard me right, 600 diabetes apps, and they are not up to scratch. So continue to use paper. <laughs> or invest in developing a 600 first one. Uh, but that's another day's discussion. Decision support. Big area. <laughs> We really expect our patients to self-manage their chronic conditions, and rightly so. We can't do it, and 99% of the time, they're on their own. You know all of that. But in terms of decision support, computers are quite good in that. And a smartphone is, is a powerful computer. 
I talked earlier about communication and various modes. Uh, the latest, which is not really the latest, is video communications. Those of you who come or have links to India or China will know that both India and China have overtaken the developed world in terms of use of video consultations. They are much more prevalent in those countries. Uh, whether they are high quality is a separate issue. And whether those doctors are trained to provide video consultations uh, is another issue. Uh, but what is given is that technology is transforming the way we deliver healthcare. If the sign Time's Up uh, wasn't raised, I would talk about AI. Uh, but we may leave this for panel discussion later. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much, Yosu. So, some, again, some very nice themes that are emerging, and it strikes me that uh, although very much we do try to emphasize the need for our graduates to be conversant, to be familiar with technology, to be familiar with it, and be able to handle technology. But at the same time as practitioners, which we all are, when we see our patients, when we handle our medical health records, we do have a certain ambivalence, a lovely relationship with technology that's reflected in the way we interact with technology. And I wonder whether that's some sort of technology hidden curriculum where we struggle with technology. I first, my electronic health medical records, every now and then, when I struggle and it crashes, and at the same time, once I get it working, I turn around to my resident and say, no, isn't technology great when it works? And by actually saying that, perhaps I'm role modeling the wrong behavior towards technology. But for many of us who struggle with technology, that truly is the, the, the daily evidence we have. And uh, for those of you who are interested in it, I think there's a really great article in, I think yesterday, or the day before, New Yorker, with uh, Abdul Gawale. New Yorker, okay. Yeah, because uh, I have a New York Times subscription, and this one told me that I have to subscribe. Anyway. Yeah. But it's a nice, I managed to get one out of three free articles. It's still in the through November. Quick, grab it when you can. But it's a nice article, you know, and the Arthur Gawadi is a very thoughtful writer, and he writes about some of his struggles with EMR and the uh, increasing number of papers. Nice one in the cabinet recently about how using EMR actually changes the way we think about our patients and our flow of clinical testing. So it's very much an interesting area which we should look at. So while we struggle with these changes in technology, in faculty <coughs> development, in curricular change, which our previous three speakers have uh, articulated, what's needed really at the ground level is strong leadership. Leadership is absolutely important to tie all these disparate threads together and make sure we're all going in the same direction. So our next speaker, um, Professor Simoyan Poitide, will be speaking to us about leadership. So uh, Professor Poitide, is um, Vice Provost for Education at the Imperial College London, and she leads this vision for an innovative and globally leading uh, learning and teaching environment, and also for an excellent student ex uh, education experience. Uh, Professor Boyden studied medicine in Utrecht, uh, received a Master's in Public Health at uh, Yale in, in, uh, in the US, and also earned a PhD degree at Leiden University in the Netherlands. Uh, she's currently implementing a new learning and teaching strategy, um, an evidence-based transformation of pedagogy to make teaching more interactive, learning physical and digital in order to create truly global students who will be effective agents for change. So to speak to us about the importance of strong leadership and clear eye leadership. That's about you. Thank you, Nigel. And thank you for, for being here and talking to us um, about this very important topic of what to teach our students. Um, and I'm talking about leadership, I want to start by emphasizing the um, need for empathy, which is a very important theme in my work and which I try to remind myself of every day. And I think leaders also need to have this empathy. Um, and there's so many things that are going to be around this morning. Uh, we need to provide better clinical care, we need to listen to our patients better, we need to do better teaching for our students, change our curriculum, we need to do better research, we need to understand innovation and technology. And there's already, there's so much that we're already doing. And one thing that I notice every day at my own university, at other university, there's a lot of suffering in academia, and I'm not using that term lightly. I really think <laughs> in staff and students. I think people in general are working too hard and feeling too much of a burden in everything they need to do. 
and I do need the leadership and vision at the institutional level can help. I think we need to first make ourselves happy and healthy because before we can start doing that for our students. All of you have been on airplanes, I'm sure you all have. Um, you'll notice that sometimes uh, they tell the flight crew telling you to, if the oxygen masks drop, first put on your own mask before you're helping your children. And that's often how I feel about us as academics. We need to first use our own oxygen masks before we can teach our students to use, or help our students to use theirs. So, so basically what I'm trying to do as a, as a leader in a university is think about how to help students and staff take better care of themselves and alleviate suffering. And one of the things we all have learned as academics from very early on is to work really, really hard. And I'm sure most of your parents have taught you that if you work hard, everything will be okay. And that's so ingrained in us that we don't need our line managers or our bosses or our presidents or vice provosts to tell us to work too hard. And you, you will still work until 1, 2, 3 o'clock at night to after your teaching and read your, write your research grants or do other things. And I'm not there to tell you to do that. It's totally ingrained. But I think academia is a really good environment, maybe not in that sense of the word, to stimulate that kind of behavior. And I think we're all going too far in that. But I'm, I'm sure there are solutions, and I feel very much um, in charge of trying to implement some of those solutions. Because it's never enough. And academia is almost like a, like a monster. You can never publish enough. You can never teach well enough. You can never develop a good enough curriculum. It's never, ever enough. So we need to find ways in ourselves and in our academic culture to reward the right behavior and to become more happy and healthy ourselves. And for me, leadership is not so much about entitlement. I'm a leader, so I'm entitled to certain things. It really is about the duty of care. And it's actually quite simple. It's not simple to implement, but the principles are quite simple. And for a good leader, it's very important to first get to know the organization, because you want the organization to be its best self. In order for an organization to be its best self, you first need to know what it's all about and what the people in the organization need. And then it's very important to develop a joint vision. Everybody in the organization needs to know what it's about. What are we trying to achieve as a group? And that's what leaders need to do. They need to have a vision. They need to understand the outside world. They're in a role that people in the organization simply can't take. It's not because we're better people. We just have that role. But it's a temporary role. Leadership is not something we get. It's not something we're born with. It's something we can develop. And sometimes it's given to you, and it's a privilege, and you need to use it well. So I can go places that lots of other people in my university can't go. So I can see things, things that government's trying to do to us, things other universities are doing, that will help me develop a vision for my organization to, its, to be its best possible self. And that vision needs to be communicated very, very frequently. Uh, the Jeep had talked about that. It's, it's very important that everybody understands where the leader wants to go with his or her organization. But it needs to be a shared vision, because if you don't know your organization, you can develop a beautiful vision. But the distance between your vision and what your organization is capable of can be far too large. And clearly, that's not going to help. And then once you've developed your vision, it's very important to make sure that you give people space and you support them and you help them. Because change is scary and you need to make change safe. And it can only be safe if they know you have their back. So if they start moving towards that joint vision, they know the leaders will actually help them. And if they fail, which everybody will, it's the end. It won't be the end. It's something part of that change and it's okay to because we're failing together. And I think that trust in people is something really important. And for trust, you also need empathy. So once you, you give that space and you give that support, and that means sometimes extra help, it means um, extra uh, innovative tools, it can mean all kinds of things. A good career path so people know it's actually worth their while. So if their role fits with the vision that you want for the institution, the better the fit for everybody, the more likely you are to get to that end point. And then, of course, you need to monitor as a leader, because if people are totally not doing what you want them to do, it's important to identify them 
and they actually help them get on board again, and if they can't get on board at some point, they may want to go somewhere else. Because if people are not doing what you want them to do, the others who are trying to keep those goals clearly aren't going to be happy. So it's important to monitor and not be, not be too naive about how it's going to be. But I think once we, we do all that, and, and, and we really are trying to get that joint vision, the organization can fly, and people in the organization can thrive. And for me, it's imperial getting the parity of esteem between teaching and research, which is the most important goal for the next five to ten years. And that's something that I want everybody to know. So it's a great opportunity today to tell my colleagues at Imperial that that's what we're going for. But that also means that I need to develop the right career paths, and I need to make it worth your while, and I need to make it something safe to go into. But I know it's the right way to go, because if we just get rewarded by our research, and it's never enough, and time's up now, I finish, thank you. Um, then clearly, as an organization, we won't be able to fly, because universities are about more than research, and then we are about training the next generation of global leaders, as I said yesterday. But I can't just expect you to know how to do that just by me telling you. So my duty of care is in making sure that I understand what the organization needs to, to go into that change, to do the right things. And I'm convinced that if we work together, and it's all about collaboration, we'll be much happier, we'll know how to teach more evidence-based. Because of course there's lots and lots of intelligence and drive in the people in the organization. So we just have to open doors and make sure people feel safe to go through them. And I know from evidence, from from looking outside and talking to colleagues in other universities, that building a strong community of teachers and students, that teaching more interactively with or without technology, technology is just a tool, never be a goal. So, will eventually make our academic community so much happier. And I think that's what it's all about. It's actually allowed to have fun and to be happy and healthy. Because if we're happy and healthy, we're going to be much more effective in training our students. So that's what I'm about at Imperial, and I think that's what most leaders should do, try to make the organization, and in our case, that students and staff and faculty happier and healthier. And I think if we, if we keep our eye on, on the goal, and we do it as a joint exercise, and we keep feeding our empathy and translating that into institutional empathy, we'll be able to get there with everybody and get into a better world for staff and students. So I think we're getting a lot of uh, interesting ideas coming up, and I'm hearing all of course because it strikes me that one of the things that perhaps we you know, try to bind the few threads together would be the notion of trust, and that we have to have a certain degree of trust to gain our students to be able to learn, to be responsible learners, um, to be able to be professionals that we wanted to be, but we also have to have trust in our faculty to be able to execute what we want them to do in order to connect their students and for our students to trust our faculty. Our same degree of trust is required for technology, but we want the technology to do what we want it to do and not betray us when we have six patients waiting for me in the clinic, banging on the door, wondering why I'm struggling with the e-prescription working. And that as leadership, trust is important. Our followers need to trust us, but we need to, need to trust our followers. And that trust is a very long currency as we work towards growing our schools and our graduates to be really for the 21st century. So I think this ends the first part of this morning session where our panelists have spoken. And now it's time for you to ask us questions. So um, maybe I'll start by um, setting up just a quick couple of quick ground rules. Um, we have actually put the mics on the uh, center of the table, so please press the top. And uh, I think that we'll kick off with Jan. Jan's got a question for us. So go for it. Thanks for the, this great introduction. I think all of the points raised are really uh, critical, and we are at a, a, a really key point of change in the whole of healthcare, which is also then important for the a really uh, important change in medical education to meet the needs of the future. I think. All of these points that have been raised are actually related to something even more central, and that is that a medical faculty is the most independent faculty at a university. 
Uh, I remember one university president telling me once that a, the definition of a university in hell is a university with two medical faculties. <laughs> When we started LKC, and I've heard this from so, so many other places starting up new medical schools, it seems an opportunity to really try and do something different. But suddenly you find you're back in the same thing. It's um, focusing on the medical needs and so on. And we tried, when we started up LKC, to really bring in technology, um, to have a different approach. But when you look at the curriculum, when you look at the focus, it's still very much a medical curriculum. We have to let in cyber technology, information science, um, because we cannot manage that ourselves. We are uh, specialists in medicine, we understand the clinical needs, but everything that's been said here is really illustrating the um, difficulty we have in our profession to cope with the rapid changes in information technology, information science, uh, in our own world. And if we can't cope with it, how can we equip our students to be able to cope with this in the future? Um, so we have to bring in others. Uh, we have to bring in people from the cyber world. We have to bring in information specialists to be able to both cope with it ourselves in our own environment, but even more importantly, to be able to equip our students to be able to cope with this, because it's changing rapidly, and we have to have the specialists that understand this in the future as part of the curriculum, uh, and part of our own work. If we don't do this, we cannot have faculty that will understand change, we cannot have faculty that feel secure in their own work, um, and uh, we won't be able to cope with what's in the future. Um, yes, I'd like to respond to this a little bit, because we also have to bear in mind that uh, we have to think about the patient. <laughs> And uh, we heard from uh, our uh, town speaker from Manea about the fact that uh, patients look for faith healers. Uh, in, uh, in France, people go for homeopathic medicine. In uh, China, people go to some aspects of traditional Chinese medicine. Uh, in every part of the world, there is a, a demand by the public to for really personal medicine in the sense of face-to-face, -face, touching, listening people who are prepared to uh, become sort of gurus. And that aspect of medicine, will, as far as I can see, will remain. And if we go too far in the, in the area of technology, uh, maybe we will desensitize this emphasize our patients. So this balance, I think, uh, has, has to be maintained. We have to listen to the patients. So, yeah. um, a few points. Uh, first, uh, Jan, when you said, if we can't do it, how can we teach our students? Um, there is this paradigm that uh, we are on the same journey, and students and teachers are partners. Uh, it's a beautiful example where we could really let students teach us. Uh, our students are very advanced users of technology, and I've experienced whenever we humble ourselves and give them, uh, and I don't consider myself old, but when I work with students, I realize what an age difference means in terms of technology, and I could, actually it would be embarrassing to share examples now, but certainly uh, because I'm in supposedly in digital health, but uh, yes, they uh, and maybe we need to think formally how we encourage our faculty uh, to invite students. How do you find that information? How do you find the answer? How do you uh, learn by using just your mobile? And uh, we have examples, not just in terms of study and learning, but also in clinical practice, where the junior doctors in ER develop uh, 
apps to calculate the dose of adrenaline in an emergency situation. And these are not validated apps, and yet are used by thousands of junior doctors. I, I could go on. Is this right approach? Is a separate discussion. Uh, the point is, let's invite students to teach us on technology. Um, second point, uh, just on this digital divide and can technology alienate uh, or not. My family lives in Europe. I'll just put it Europe uh, to be more specific. Uh, I can tell you how much uh, FaceTime means to me. In video FaceTime, it means a lot. It really brings us to each other. Uh, grandparents can see their grandchildren. Uh, yes, it's not quite the same as cuddling. It's not quite the same. My daughter, who is six, she's hugging iPad to show them. She's kissing iPad to show them you know, the, the empathy, to show them the affection, the love. Uh, I, keep, I tried to, I used to tr uh, try to tell her, look, that's not quite what you should be doing. And after a while, I realized that's probably the next generation's expression of how they show uh, emotions. Uh, it's not the same, but uh, here's an example of how you can bring emotions, how you can bring listening uh, with technology. Uh, so technology doesn't need to alienate. I'd like to add to that, and then you are saying it particularly. Uh, I think we need to realize that um, what everybody needs, uh, teachers, patients, students, they want to be seen, they want to be heard, they want to be understood. And I think we need to use technology to increase that. And of course, there is a risk that it will alienate us. But if we want to keep that sense of community, which I think we need also in the classroom, we use technology to enhance that. And I think for me, the flip classroom is a really good example. You have another really great one with your children and, and FaceTiming. But if we use, if we do teaching in the old-fashioned way, the lecture theater with one person in front, that's a very distant way of teaching, but for me it's more distant than some teaching online. And if we put all the knowledge transition in a space where students just look at the video at home, but then when they come into the classroom, there really is much more interaction like it's possible in a space like this, where the teacher literally can walk around and stand next to students and talk to them about what they're doing with the particular poem. Then I think we're really using technology to increase that sense of being heard and seen. I think we shouldn't forget that in the old-fashioned way of, of doing medical work, of doing teaching, of reading institutions, we do a lot of stuff that's very distant and that doesn't show our students, our academics, our patients, that we care, that we hear them, that we see them. So if we can take care of the more technical bits of our interaction with technology, we have a lot more opportunity to actually engage and be happy and show our human emotions than we did in the past. But that's something that should guide us, not what's out there, what's different, what's happening, and what can make us look good as an institution. But how can we use technology to increase that sense of community instead of decrease it? And I think modern technology has incredible, this incredible opportunity. My daughter is now in Bogota. She flew last night. This morning when I woke up, there was apps from her and her boyfriend and a picture of how they met up at the airport. I was a little worried about that. That they wouldn't see each other in one time, she would be stuck there on her own. In the past, I wouldn't have known. And Martin told me yesterday when he was a teenager in his early 20s and traveled the world, his parents wouldn't hear from him for months. <coughs> so I think modern technology can help a lot, and that's what we need to use it for. Thank you very much. I, I mean, I completely agree with all of you uh, and your thoughts. But also, I feel that we must not lose the plot here. Um, for, for example, I think what we need to do is that I firmly believe that we need to use the technology to get our students and us to think critically, apply, and then also use technology to help us to understand concepts more, and then develop our abilities to adapt and adapt. Now, why am I saying this? Because our, my own experience uh, earlier at University of Colombo, 
and some of my own colleagues from University of Indonesia uh, in, in uh, Jakarta, uh, we had a very interesting conversation. Uh, because what happened was that these two institutions, University of Colombo as well as University of Indonesia, uh, they are in a country that is rapidly developing or, or in, 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 in the Asian region. And we use technology a lot because these are universities with quite a bit of money and resources in those countries and uh, quite established. So they use a lot of technology and they are teaching hospital, academic teaching hospital, use modern gadgets and you know all the PET scans, CT scans, etc. So their undergraduates and residents are trained very well in this. But when they go out there into the practice environment, into rural communities, they feel that they are fish out of water. So we need to be aware of our own practice environments. Even in Singapore, how would they, when they go to Senkang Polyclinic, right? I'm sure I'm, no one is going to beat me with, from St. Uh, or, you know, uh, out there, would it be the same as in Tantok Singh or NUH or at, when they train at uh, Sing Singapore General Hospital? Are we training them to think and to, to use those technologies or adapt to that particular practice environment? So what happened in both places is that they were very frustrated. They were not effective. They couldn't help the, the, the health services in those rural communities. And very soon, they came back to the central parts, leaving those rural areas. The moment they could come to a central place, they came back. So I think technology is great. We must use it. However, we need to get our students to use those technologies in a way that will help them in the future in their practice and yeah, I just wanted to comment on the, the um, uh, comment on balance, finding a balance between you know the, the wonders of the technology and um, being completely overwhelmed by it. Um, I think you know like like yeah, I feel from I feel from one day. Uh, in the US, they're talking about you know crises of burnout amongst um, physicians and, and doctors in the US from the overwhelming expectations of technology. And here we we all ourselves are guilty of it. You know, when do we know when to turn off? Um, uh, you know, the emails, the WhatsApp. There's a huge expectation that if if a message comes in, you must answer it immediately. Yeah? and so. You know, um, teaching ourselves and our students and our, our faculty members um, when enough is enough and, um, and uh, you know, uh, how to use technology wisely and, and um, you know, with, with the right balance. And going back to what you said, Simone, uh, in terms of making sure that we ourselves are healthy and happy, I think um, it's, it's going to be um, the challenge. <laughs> Thanks, Adiba. Now I feel really guilty about sending the email out to the students and not trying to do all my students, I apologize. I've been role modeling at Digital Day. Yeah. So, thanks. I think the first point was a very stimulating discussion, and I think there's a, a question from the floor. Maybe Carmen has a question for us. Uh, thanks, Nigel. Thanks, everyone, for that very insightful um, perspective. I just want to uh, slightly disagree with the view that the users of technology are the experts in technology. We always think that students, because they use a lot of technology, are the experts who will then you know, co-construct where technology should go. I, I can't remember the exact studies, but a couple of studies that show that people who use technology often don't, may not use it in a very sophisticated way. And being in university, we have access to these strange people called engineers, who I think are uh, experts in technology. And I think this relates to this issue about uh, faculty incentives as well. I've noticed that we work very individualistically, and the incentives aren't really there for us to work across uh, disciplines. Right? So when we think about these ideas, also, we seem to think about them very individualistically. So how can we change this? <laughs> Thank you, that's a really great comment, and actually I know a few, a few studies looking at students and their supposed digital nativity, if that's a word, um, and students aren't the digital natives that we think they are, they actually can be super conservative. So one of the problems with introducing technology in different ways of teaching is that students will often resist 
And one of the things you need to do when you start introducing new methodologies is not just help your staff adopt them and adapt them and use them, but also help the students understand what you're trying to do. And you're right, you need to work together to use engineers and use all the, 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 the savviness that we have as an institution and not just expect our students. They, they'll just do whatever we tell them to do. It's a good point. We hope not to offend anybody. And, and they are digital natives, so thanks. Yeah. Age for quite a while has not been uh, determined by the date when you're born. Uh, so we know that uh, we even now uh, may change gender. Uh, so why not age? And um, I'm being serious in terms of age, and I, I won't go into philosophical or, or other domains. But what I want to say is that um, in terms of the digital literacy, Yes, there is a difference, and you have faculty, you have patients who are 70 plus, who are very advanced users of technology, and uh, to come in defense of our students, um, we are sometimes overzealous in terms of technology. I'll give you an example and a question to the audience. Uh, we teach a lot on iPads. Uh, there is now good evidence and research that using iPads at, uh, in the evening distracts circadian rhythm. I'm part of, uh, I'm doing some of that research. Uh, we should actually not be encouraging use of iPads in the evening. Um, Apple has recognized this and Windows has recognized this, they introduced to do this. You might have seen the toning, the night mode of the screens. That doesn't quite do the trick fully. Uh, so there is some reflection for us how and when we do want our students. Um, I was really touched by what Simone said about uh, you know pushing it too far and where is the limit of how we uh, how much we study by just staying with students. You know, do they study late into night? Um, we're disrupting their sleep by doing that if they are using technology rather than traditional books or. Uh, those non-light non emitting sources, so you could have, uh, you know, white digital paper. Uh, and I would love to hear solutions. Do you advise your students when not to use technology? Uh, <laughs> Again, I, I don't disagree with anyone, uh, but and also uh, this is coming from a very Asian Singaporean setting, right? What really I completely agree, right? I mean, you can have beautiful, wonderful vision of collaboration and getting people to collaborate across, right? But we, our behaviors are driven by the way we are evaluated. Full stop, right? So my own humble sort of you know observation from our setting about three years ago, because we realized that we are not collaborating enough, especially in the three tripartite mission of NUHS, right? Uh, research, education, and in services. So one of the key things that changed this behavior was the team bonus, right? The moment we introduced three years ago the team bonus, and then I can remember a year ago, right, a particular very strong department where they published in Cell and Nature, and we have, I think, one Nobel laureate also working in this particular department. When it came to the final evaluation, that research was outstanding. Services, okay. Education was very poor. They did not get a team bonus. If you don't get a team bonus, no one will get any bonuses. So there was relentless pressure on the leadership. And I'm really, really grateful to our team who said, no, you're not getting it. Right? And the next year, there was a series of emails from the HOD to Center for Medical Education. Can you help us collaborate to improve our teaching scores and our uh, curriculum. So I completely agree. We have
have to have that vision. We have to have that strategic vision and also the, the leadership's commitment. But we also have to have systems in place to make sure that that will work. Thank you. Other questions from the floor? Yes, there's a question. Yeah. Good morning. Sorry, can you hear me? Um, just, yeah, just press the button to speak. Yeah. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my question is directed to Dr. Samar Sekara. Um, you said at the beginning of your talk that one of the major obstacles really to producing better practitioners was the existing nature of the faculty itself are largely biomedically trained doctors. Um, so um, I'm wondering if it would be useful to have a broader or more open concept of what faculty might be to actually include uh, patients in a bigger way. Um, if patients are really at the center of everything that doctors learn and do, uh, might it not be useful if patients uh, were more involved in learning and teaching, not just in the clinical years, but from the very get-go itself? Um, I should say that I'm a patient advocate with a, a, a very um, passionate research interest in doctor-patient communication and uh, relationship. And I give a talk every year, actually, to the NUS first-year students on navigating the healthcare system from a patient's perspective. Um, but that's about 40 minutes a year. <laughs> I've done it for nine years. And I'm not sure how much, um, how much more actual, how many more encounters of that sort um, medical students actually have. And if we are more concerned about the accelerating use or development of technology, um, in medical education and healthcare in general, and we're worrying about losing the human touch, might it not be useful at the same time that technology accelerates to actually accelerate the exposure and involvement of patients as well to retain that human touch and connection? Thank you. Uh, again, I seem to be agreeing today to everything including my wife who in the morning, she did not know that I am engaged today on Saturday in this thing. So when I took down these notes in the early morning, what I'm going to talk about, uh, at the back of the thing, when I got ready, she said, okay, that's all right, you can go, but bring me all these things on you know, the shopping list at the back. <laughs> so today I agree. So I'm agreeing, I'm in agreement. So again, there's no question about it. Uh, also, I want to stand corrected because I, I, what I shared is that the biggest uh, challenge is the faculty, not only biomedical faculty, but I said all three categories, right? Biomedical uh, faculty, clinician educators, and educators, we ourselves, because if we do not go and understand how our uh, teachers are working in basic sciences and clinical years, then again, we are our an obstacle. We are lotus seating, medical educators sitting at the centers, you know, coming out with beautiful pedagogically correct things, but practically it cannot be applied. So, see, we ourselves are to blame as well. Right? Okay. Now, you're absolutely right. I think your, we, we start with your lecture, uh, but then the students, we need to get them exposed from year one itself. So, we have started several projects. I'm sure same at LKC as well. Uh, 100% sure that we have, like for example, the longitudinal patient exposure. There are three medical students, two nursing students from uh, Young Building. They are attached to a patient with a chronic illness throughout the five years. Okay. So they go to their home, they, they, they get to know their, their relatives, their day to day interactions. When they get admitted to the hospital, they, they follow them up from year one and year two, right, because they have more free time. So I think it's extremely important to get them exposed to patients early or people in the community much earlier. And then I strongly believe we don't have that yet, but what I understood, because I have two groups of uh, LPE students, uh, we meet occasionally, and uh, the faculty gives us uh, quite a generous sum of uh, money to take them for you know, nice tea, coffee, and, and have uh, lunch, and then have these reflective discussions. What did you learn? So what are some issues, challenges, etc.? So some of my students are actually using FaceTime with the, with the patients, right? With their longitudinal patients and their relatives, right? And they, they, they Skype 
um, then they zoom and you do all kinds of things. So that actually brings them much closer. So sometimes when the patient uh, wants to come to the, the polyclinic, they will <coughs> zoom and say, okay, I'm in the polyclinic now. Uh, you know, I'm having some issues, but can you help me or things like that. So absolutely, I, I completely agree with you that uh, technology can help enhance this experience and exposure from the, from, from the very beginning. And we need to start programs from year one itself, uh, not wait until the third year. <coughs> Yeah, so uh, likewise, uh, you know, we've uh, you know, continued the emphasis on, on patient interaction, but what we've done slightly differently in, in uh, the new curriculum is the early introduction to patients right from day one through the um, introduction to clinical skills, but also in the communication skills. We're fortunate that you know we still have a lot of patients who are willing to come forward and with very small compensation and, and sit in the communication skills class and not use um, you know uh, actors or, or, or staff. So that there is that, and then of course in the clinical years, and there's also a, a strong emphasis on um, community um, involvement with our students, whether it's during their stint in public health or um, uh, electives. We we organise practice where they go to rural uh, Malaysia, usually in East Malaysia, and actually uh, live with families in East Malaysia and, and you know it's 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 a, it's a structured program where they go with our, our trip, um, teachers. So um, and in, in public health um, uh, the module they similarly they, they go to the clinics and um, spend time and also um, like have home stays with with families in, in sort of more rural Malaysia. So there is an opportunity to closely interact with uh, patients and their friends. Thanks, Michael. I'll give you one last question, and uh, you've got the uh, mic. Well, I was just going to, I was going to thank Publisher for, for raising that, because I think it's such an important point. Um, and at Advocacy Medicine as well, we also have a pro long term patient project, and we involve patients in, in the early years, but I think we could do more in that regard. But I think I also want to make the point that with any program of curricular change, I think it is really important that we are interdisciplinary, that we involve students, but that we also involve patients. Um, but I think the other challenge we face with curriculum and curriculum reform is the educators themselves. Now, of course, that's around faculty development, but it's also around having full-time educators who are valued and have uh, a career path ahead of them because, of course, we have basic scientists who teach part-time, we have clinicians who teach part-time, but I think we need to invest more in full-time educators, both when they come from a clinical or a scientific background, but we need to make sure that they have an attractive career ahead of them. Uh, I think we could probably do better here in that regard. Thanks, David. I think that's a really good point. Then. I think many a times, I mean, most of us who have gone through our training will realize that much of what we learn is from role models. And having good role models that role model the right behavior, that even as clinicians, we strive to bring the vision for us into the consultations, maybe the teaching activities. I think that's really important, over and above the formal part of the curriculum, like uh, long term vision projects and uh, long term follow up options. I think at the end of the day, our clinician educators, whether from the biomedical field or from the healthcare clusters, are really our uh, guys will make the biggest difference in our students. So I think we have now in 45, and that brings us to the end of our session. So thank you very much, um, everybody, for being here today and for participating so actively. Can I also take the opportunity to thank our four speakers today, Jose, Kaliba, Simone, and Bajiba, for a very, very lively and engaging session. Thank you very much.